You mentioned criminality in your talk. Could you give us some more details about that? Yes, that's uh, why I mentioned Don Corleone. Uh, because uh, in my mind, it was mostly a mafia type of uh, you know, um, political class. Uh, in, in some countries in today's world, uh, you know, politicians or political classes, they look more and more like mafia used to be. I mean, Italian mafia, of course, I'm relating to. Uh, which was not only um, a game of gaining uh, money or power, but also eliminating the others, not in order not to give them the time and the possibility to be become rich and become powerful. So that has been the game in Iranian society for the past 40 years. They, these, uh, these gentlemen, actually, I would say, they have been killing each other all the time. Uh, not only killing their opponents, but they're killing themselves, they're killing each other. Why? Because uh, it's a war of ma it's a mafia war, actually. It's a kind of a war among the criminals themselves. Um, and why? Because the nature of politics in the Iranian regime has become more and more criminal. Uh, and I think that uh, for. Um, in the case of uh, revolutionary guards, for example, Iranian revolution, uh, uh, um, replacing the classical army, which a classical army has always its own task, which can be nationalistic task, but also always a task of defending, you know, the sovereignty and the territory. Uh, the, uh, their task was not exactly that. I mean, their task had become more was much more ideologically based and. And of course, in the long run, after the end of the war with Saddam Hussein, they became also one of the criminal organizations in Iran because they started uh, having prisoners, torturing people, but at the same time uh, participating uh, in the Iranian economy and uh, you know controlling all the imports and exports of Iran. So that's the point that I, I was referring to. Yes, a uh, question for you. Um, it has been stated by the Iranian government that they are not interested in nuclear weapons. My question to you is, do you believe them? Do you believe that they aren't? Or that they are? And if they are, who would they look to threaten with those nuclear weapons? And this is a very good question. But I mean, uh, what I believe or not believe is not important because I, uh, you know, my belief has no uh, power to change things. But I mean, of course, I'm somebody who has been involved with the Iranian politics without being uh, in polit any political uh, party for a long time. Um, so in, I would say Iran has the capacity and capability of having a nuclear warfare. Maybe they don't have it right now, but they could have the possibility of having it. Now, of course, if they have to use it, they will use it ideologically, as they have been doing it with other armaments and weapons. I mean, they will certainly use it against Israel if they want to use it. They can use it against Saudi Arabia. But uh, they know, so you know, I, we are talking about um, people who are, despite what it, it shows, they are not stupid. And if they were stupid, they could not actually eliminate others and become so rich and so powerful. So they are not stupid. And it, it, sometimes they are very, very pragmatic. So that's why, actually, I think the nuclear agreement was a very pragmatic thing on the side of Iran. Uh, they think they are betrayed by the Trump administration, fully betrayed. But it was actually a, a, a pragmatic move from their side, uh, Rouhani's side and uh, Zarif's side, because they felt that they would not have the power to confront uh, Saudi Arabia, Israel. Uh, they, had, they have a lot of uh, fish to cook. Uh, they have Syria, they have Hezbollah in Lebanon, they have the problems in Yemen. So, you know, that makes a lot of money spent uh, outside Iran just to have the hegemony. And I think it's uh, the nuclear warfare for Iran is kind of a threat, you know? Okay, you don't touch it. It's like North Korea is their example. You know, Let's, let us be like North Korea. I, we will we respect it if we, we have a nuclear uh, armament. So, uh, I think they, they mostly think in this logic, you know, uh, more than anything else. Uh, you mentioned without the revolution, there would not have been an ISIS or Al-Qaeda. Oh, Ar aren't you ignoring the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan as well as the seizure of the Grand Mosque in Mecca? Because they both also happened in 1979. Yeah, but Soviet invasion happened because of the Iranian revolution. Because uh, Soviets were really worried about the fact that, uh, you know, they didn't want the Islamists to become, 
to come to power in, in Iran. Uh, don't think that because, uh, I mean, uh, you had the Tudor Party or the Iranian Communist Party who defended in the beginning the Ayatollahs and the Islamic regime that they didn't want to get the power at some point. Actually, they, they did. And uh, that's why uh, the Iranian regime moved against them before they would move against the Islamic regime. And uh, Soviets actually embedded it just because of that. And I think no, I, I really I really believe that without the Islamic, without the Iranian revolution, you would not have had all these changes that we have today in the, in the Middle East. It was a huge, it had a huge effect. And the effect is very similar to the French Revolution in the 18th century. I mean, look at the, all the monarchies around Europe, you look at what happened in the 19th century. All the 19th century Europe is actually influenced by the French Revolution. And today, uh, I'm not saying that uh, MBS in Saudi Arabia and all the other things which are happening or Israel are not important. Uh, yes, certainly. But, you know, uh, Iranian regime is still a regime which, if we don't call it a rock state, we can call it a difficult regime, which is not very easily, cannot very easily come and sit at the table and talk about world politics. Uh, you know, as somebody like Macron might do it. Uh, so we're talking about another paradigm of uh, thinking, you know, and this paradigm of thinking actually has caused a lot of trouble in the, in the Middle East and uh, outside the Middle East. Uh, you talk about the, the, the mafia family. It's controlled Don Don Corleone, yeah. Yeah, Don Corleone. Uh, what was the rule of the <coughs> foreign countries like U.S. Uh, policy uh, what was the rule of U.S. policy uh, to empowering this uh, mafia in Iran? <coughs> By containment, maybe. But um, I think that by engaging uh, on the on the wrong side, also sometimes, you know, for example, in the war against uh, Saddam, uh, Saddam was supported by the Americans, <coughs> so they actually created a monster, and after that they had to get rid of that monster. It's like Frankenstein, and Dr. Frankenstein creating Frankenstein after that he has to get rid of his creature. And yeah, the same with Gaddafi actually. So I think that um, the moves were wrong, uh, I mean, from my point of view, were wrong uh, at the time, and, but I understand why they happened, because um, Americans, even in the beginning, as you know, uh, with their uh, ambassador in Tehran and uh, with all the envoys they had, uh, they actually, they thought that, well, this is the end of the Shah, this is the end of the monarchy, let's get along with the new regime. And they thought that the new regime would be people like Bazargan, or let's say Uta, or, or Banisat in the, in the worst threat, okay? Uh, it didn't happen. I mean, they were all eliminated, and you cannot deal with uh, revolutionary guards, you know, because revolutionary guards are not politicians. You know, they are. Uh, if if we don't want to call them actually uh, thugs and criminals, at least we can call them people who don't know anything about politics. So they will not certainly sit down at the table and talk about politics with you without bringing up, uh, you know, problems of violence and hegemony. And this, Americans, I think, and the Russians, of course, they were very afraid of. I mean, they had to deal with it. And still, uh, they're trying to deal with it. I mean, I think that Iranian, uh, Iranian politics is very difficult to understand and to deal with. Uh, I had many times, when I was living in Iran, I had uh, conversations with um, ambassadors. You know, um, uh, not Canadian ambassador maybe, uh, but French, British, and many other ambassadors. And they had, the, I, I, I could understand that they had a lot of trouble analyzing Iranian politics. A lot of trouble. It was difficult for them to understand because it was so contradictory. And he would say, should we go towards the reform? Or should we go to the... I said, no, well, you know, this is more than that. You know, it's more than that, as I was trying to explain. You cannot just say that, okay, we go on the side of reformers and everything is uh, done. It was not done. It was night and day with, during Khatanistan. So, uh, 
So when you mentioned that if the uh, current uh, powers were to fall, you'd likely see between maybe a reinstatement of uh, the, Sh uh, the Shah royal family or the Revolutionary Guard taking over. Iran has had a democratic more or Republican more or less government in the past that may have ended up being su successful without foreign intervention, uh, removing them. Why I realize that well, you had you had the um, before Rashad was put back into power. Oh, most of it. Yeah, most of that. So a short time. A short time, but that's not a, I think Iran's fault. That that's no. other issues. Why couldn't maybe ne not necessarily a Western democratic state, but why do you see those two as the major options? Well, first of all, uh, you said it's not Iran's fault. I think that uh, you know any country which turns into tyranny is not only the fault of uh, foreigners. You have to look at your own citizens also. And there is a point where uh, French people, Germans, Japanese, they would turn and say, okay, we had Hitler, why did we choose Hitler? You know, so Iranians, they have at some point, they should ask themselves the difficult question which they don't want to ask. Because it's, it's easier to find, you know, a scapegoats and say, okay, these were the guys who were going to kill them and it's going to be finished. And that's not the case for me. And you have to explain psychological hysteria of people, of populations who go and make a revolution or who accept the killing of innocent people, like people who collaborated with the uh, Shah regime. And they tolerated seeing their photos and pictures on the first pages of the Iranian journals. I mean, why, what should that be? I mean, it, it needs a kind of a psychology. So I do believe that uh, it's very important. If Iranian people, they want change, they have to have a dialogue among themselves. I, I'm a man of dialogue. I think that we need to create forms of their dialogue. The dialogue with the Iranian regime is not possible. It has shown it for the past 40 years. It's not a regime of dialogue. It's not a dialogical regime. Doesn't like dialogue, you know? <laughs> Any kind of dialogue. I mean, I was following, uh, you know, the Gilets Jaunes in France and uh, French politics. Uh, I, I love these French people, you know, maybe because I grew up with them. But the fact that you have the French president coming and saying, okay, I want to dialogue with the people. I mean, this is a very positive thing, you know? Now, I don't think that this is possible. It, I can assure you, maybe some of the young Iranians sitting in this room, they can testify that. I can assure you that the young Iranians, innocent young Iranians, who came out in the 2009, they were looking for a dialogue. They didn't, they didn't use any, any uh, uh, violence against the Iranian regime. But the regime could not tolerate their presence in the public sphere, you know? Could not tolerate it. And there was no way that either the leaders, who were not good leaders from my point of view, or those sitting in the Iranian government, they could have engaged in a dialogue with them. It was not. I would say that, and this I think is very, very important. I mentioned it a little bit, but I want to emphasize it. I think that a huge gap is not only demographic gap, this is, as a philosopher I said, it's an ontological gap. Ontological gap between Iranian youth, Iranian young people, and the Islamic regime in Iran. They, as if they're coming from two different planets. They don't understand each other at all. And they don't speak the same language. And they are in two different <coughs> universes, you know, two different universes. Uh, what was the uh, Western countries' role into the revolution of Iran in 2017? The role they had? Yes. yes. I think they played the role? Yeah, they were, they, they were defending uh, their own interests. You know? I think that uh, uh, this is a question which comes up uh, all the time. I, and people say, uh, well, you know, the revolution was done by the Americans, the revolution was done by the British, the revolution was done by, in Guadalupe. I said, you know, nations, nation states, are supposed to defend their own interests, like Canadians sitting in this world. They defend first Canadian interests, then they defend French or Iranian and other interests. This is uh, normal. So I think that all these governments, when they, they knew that uh, the monarchy could not 
uh, prevail and the monarchy could not remain in power. They abandoned the Shah of Iran. That's for sure. They did that. They agreed among each other that they should abandon them. And they didn't know what to support later on. But since they knew that, anyway, Ayatollah Khomeini is coming, people wanted him to come, and the others who didn't want to come, uh, him to come, they were really a minority, they accepted the fact. They said, okay, we're going to continue having diplomatic relations with you. Even the Americans continue <coughs> having diplomatic relations until the hostage taking of the embassy, of the American embassy. So I think they always try, try to defend their own interests. I don't believe in conspiracy theory. You know, conspiracy theory is nonsense. You cannot explain history through conspiracy theory. And Iranians love conspiracy theory. You know? <laughs> because it's the easiest way to take. You know? It's the easiest way to take. And you cannot explain things with conspiracy theory. I'm sorry. Um, you touched briefly on the thread between uh, Fedayeen and Islam and uh, Muslim Brotherhood, etc. In one of the narratives of, of the revolution that you often hear is that the clerics came and stole it. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. If you think that narrative still holds. For 40 years. I think the narrative still holds. I think that there was this link. I think that uh, we know it uh, by fact that uh, Ayatollah Khomeini himself, and uh, being very close to Nawab Safavi and Fedayeen Islam, uh, and Fedayeen Islam, and we know by fact historically that they had contacts with the uh, Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. They actually, Nawab went to Egypt and contacted them. Uh, so, um, I think the model that they wanted to have in the 1940s, when uh, Khomeini was very young and they, they wanted uh, actually the, the model of the Muslim Brotherhood in Iran, was exactly what the Fedayeen Islam came, uh, became, actually by assassinating prime ministers, intellectuals like Kastrovi and others. They actually were fighting the same, uh, I think, emblems and, and uh, symbols that Khomeini and others did after the revolution, meaning secularism, uh, liberalism, you know, modernity, modern values, uh, especially on the side of women or uh, intellectuals. They actually, they showed it. When you go to a, to a tribunal and you uh, kill an intellectual, it, you do it actually, this is uh, very apparent, I would say, as a, as a gesture, as a political gesture that we don't need intellectuals. We have our own clergy. Why do we need intellectuals? Oh, we kill them. And, and I think that the, the role which was played with them was very important. That's why I said, um, despite the fact that traditionally, uh, the sh sh in Shiism, you don't have this kind of fundamentalism and uh, you don't have this kind of political Islamism, uh, but, uh, and you had it um, actually in different periods only, uh, but this was a, before uh, MKO and before uh, actually the uh, religious political groups that we had and we still have in Iran, today were among Iranians outside Iran, this was a line of thought which became very, very important, but it didn't become important because of Iranians, it became important because of the Arabs. They started it actually, and the Iranians copied. Um, in terms of the society in Iran, how do you see the movement, the current movement in Europe? There are too many underneath uh, the skin of the society movement right now. And uh, how do you see these kind of movement? Do you think... That what do you see underneath? Sorry, yeah, what like, do you mean by underneath? Like the labor movement right now in Europe, Haftape, or uh, Fulat... Uh, yeah, uh, the steel? Yeah, exactly, the, the steel laborers. Or, there are too many laborers. Um, they have uh, too many movements in Europe right now. So what, how do you see these kind of movements? Do you think they can end up in a revolution like um, the Commune de Paris, or in 1871? Or do you see it's just like a dream to have a society which have high knowledge to improve their, uh, let the quality of the revolution or quality of the reform in the near future? How do you see this movement? Uh, this is a very good question, actually, because I believe that all these different uh, movements that you call them, actually working class, intellectuals, artists, women's, uh, youth movement, uh, they are very uh, de deconstructed and they are very separated from each other. 
meaning they don't follow each other actually. They, uh, they actually uh, they work like trade unionists. I mean, they, they, they work on, in their own group, in their own circle. Without the, for example, intellectuals, uh, they are not in contact with the working class. And the Iranian youth, they have their own problems, which is unemployment, but it can be uh, problems of uh, behavior, you know, uh, which, which makes problems, or Islamic purity for them, or the hijab for women. These are not exactly the same problems as you have it for the teachers when they go on strike, or you have it for the laborers or uh, working class. Uh, that, that makes it very difficult. And it ha it's, it's like that. It's very disparate because you don't have a leadership. One of the things which has been missing, and of course, again, I come back to this criminal nature of the Islamic regime, is that uh, Islamic regime was quite intelligent in knowing that they had to destroy all the leaders inside and outside Iran. Nobody, no leader should be left. Because if you have leaders, you can have organization. So, and, and the, the, the example, I mean, the, the, the experience comes from the revolution itself. Because they were good organizers in the mosques, outside. They knew how to organize people, how to influence people. And uh, they used everybody they could. And they know that Iranians have the, possi have the possibility to reorganize themselves, uh, especially with the uh, population of the young population. And they saw it in uh, 2009. So they want to stop it at any, any way they can. And uh, the fact is that, you can see uh, Iranians sitting in this room, they all disagree with each other. <laughs> because there is no one leadership. They, there is no one leadership. Of course, it goes with the temperament of Iranians, also like Arabs or others maybe, of this region of the world, that they all, they like disagreeing, you know? <laughs> Agreement is not actually one of the, I would say, forceful sides of, uh, of my um, of Iranian nation. But um, this is also what, I mean, you know, politics is something that you learn. Uh, you learn it actually on an experience, on a, on a basis, on a daily basis. And if you don't practice it, Iranians have not been practicing uh, politics for 40 years. They have been practicing violence. And when you don't practice uh, politics after 40 years, you don't know how to do the things, you know? You, everything you do is always wrong. Uh, even at the level of leadership, you don't know how to have good leaders. You even, uh, and that's, that's one of the big problems that we have today. Who's supposed to come and... Because we're looking for saviors, and saviors is not exactly the terminology that we need to use in Iranian politics. We actually need leaders, but leaders who are, have, uh, they know how to organize people. And, uh, of course, to, uh, to, to, to push forward the politics, I would say, Iranian politics. Uh, you mentioned you were, uh, you were optimistic about the change in Iran, but now you kind of underestimate yourself because you said... No, I said hopeful pessimism. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, would, what would be the alternative uh, to this regime? So what do you think? What's your prospect of the future Iran? You know, you should not ask that question <laughs> because there is, no, there is no one alternative like that for the time being. Uh, that we can say, okay, this is the alternative, I know that, and this is more of a prophecy, if I say it. So, once again, in, in pragmatic politics, prophecy has no place. So I don't believe in, uh, in the fact that I can come and say, you know, uh, I know that, uh, for example, uh, the young prince, he, he will be the, you know, the next politician in Iran, or the next leader uh, of Iranians. I don't know that. Uh, it's, and, and, and the facts don't, don't show it very clearly, you know, because uh, uh, the difference with the Iranian Revolution was that the Iranian Revolution actually, uh, first of all, the Shah of Iran, he was wrong to ac accept the Iranian Revolution. You know, he was one of the people who, uh, in the middle of the revolution, he said, okay, I heard your voice, I, I, there is a revolution. And people didn't know, and they said, okay, so we are making a revolution, it's good. The Shah of Iran comes and says, we are making a revolution. And then you had the clergy coming and saying, okay, we are the leaders. And they actually, and everybody, everybody and again, the question was, why did people accept the fact when the clergy, when the clergy came and said, we are your leaders, and they said, okay, you be our leaders. They didn't say, no, we don't want you. 
we want the other person. And after, as I would say, after uh, maybe uh, November, or December, no, let's say, let's call it when Khomeini went to Paris in December, I think December 1978, it was already too late. December 1978 was too late, and Shah left in January, and Khomeini came back in February. No, he came back, yes, he came back in early February, and then you had uh, the end of the Iranian revolution. Uh, so, again, uh, to your question, I, I believe that instead of looking around and saying, okay, I'm going to find this person or that person, is the platform which is important. Why, why do we want to change Iran? On what basis we want to make change Iran? Are we going to make a better Iran or a worse Iran? You know, because when people come to me and say, "Okay, we're going to kill half of Iran to save the other half," like in the uh, you know, devils, I said, "No, no, please don't do that." You know, I don't want you. You know, I, as a one as one Iranian, uh, I don't want to have a regime like that, which comes uh, immediately comes and say, "Okay, we are now the new barbarians, but we are going to kill the late barbarians." No, this should not. But once again, we need a lot of time to dialogue among ourselves. And I think this dialogue is completely absent. My question is about sort of the relationship between the religious element of the leadership in Iran and leftist elements of the leadership in Iran, especially going back to the revolution. Because I think if you look at the Iranian government, there are similarities with the way they administer their government and the way the Soviet Union administered yes. their government, especially from the perspective of the sporting revolution. It's Parallel, like secret police and army that often come yes. in conflict with each other. And as you were mentioning, the two big party and communists allied with the religious element of the state. So, is there or does there still exist a secular left in Iran? And how does it relate to the religious left in Iran? And especially if you look at someone like Ahmadinejad, who, you know, despite being a Muslim fundamentalist, did what it was himself, I think, a university or something. <coughs> who advocated for some reform for poor people as a populist in that sense. Where, who, like, is that a real relationship? Is that a tense relationship? And in the event that the Revolutionary Guard captures control of the parliament and is threatened to do, fails to resolve the economic crisis, is there a leftist undercurrent to the government? Or is that just sort of a, a propaganda you hear about trying to compare communists and Islamists to the city? No, I don't see any leftist undercurrent. And uh, I think that um, the fact that the Tudor party and some of the leftists actually supported, uh, uh, I mean, they supported it uh, uh, by phases. Uh, they, they supported the Islamic regime. It was mainly because, because of their ideology, you know, and of course because of the, the wrong analysis that they had of the Iranian uh, revolution, because they, in their minds, they were re reading Lenin, uh, Lenin and Mao Zedong, and they were saying, okay, these people are the bourgeoisie, these people are the revolutionary bourgeoisie, so uh, we're going to get along with revolutionary bourgeoisie because it's anti-imperialist, meaning Ayatollah Khomeini, I mean, imagine that. And we're going to kill uh, or accept the killing of the Bazargan group because they are liberals. You know, one of the slogans in 1979 in uh, Tehran and the big cities of Iran was to get rid of the liberals. Get rid of the liberals. We don't want liberals. You know, people are sitting in this room who are leftists and uh, they cannot... Uh, uh, attest that. And so that was the case. But why did they come to this analysis? Because actually they were not looking at the reality. They were looking at their books and what they were really reading in their pamphlets. And their ideology was more important than the, what they were seeing in front of their eyes. And uh, it was completely wrong because they eliminated or they accepted to eliminate monarchists, liberals, and many others in the beginning, and they got eliminated themselves, or they had to go to exile after that. So that was, uh, I think, the element which we had. And again, you have the same, I would say, errors happening in the French Revolution. Because uh, one of the cases of the French Revolution, which is very comparable with uh, Iran, is the killing of Louis XVI. You know, in the beginning, uh, even Robespierre and others in 1789, they don't agree to kill the king. But then, later on, they do. And when they started killing, when they kill the king, they start killing the other 
pol uh, polit uh, political parties will dismantle them and get rid of them. So that's the first part, uh, I mean, the first answer to your question. The second answer, I mean, is outdated. You know, I don't think that if there, if there is a, a, a violent move from, uh, like a coup d'etat, coming from uh, revolutionary guards, revolutionary guards never liked somebody like Ahmadinejad, despite the fact that he comes from the old sports himself, and he went to war also with them. They don't like him. They don't eat him. That's the point. They don't need, they don't need somebody like Ahmadinejad. Why do they need somebody like Ahmadinejad? And uh, because the whole point is that, I think the point is uh, that if they, get the, if they take the power, is to say, we're going to have a non-clerical regime, which is a continuity of the Islamic regime, but it's non-clerical. And that's the point. Because many Iranians, they hate clergy. But if some group come and say, like in, uh, let's say in a kind of a Ziaul Hap or a kind of a Qaddafi type, say, we are militaries, we are, of course we do that in the name of Islam, but we do it without clergy, and the clergy are, all the faults and errors are on the, uh, is, were done by the clergy. So from this, we're starting a new Iran, okay? That might work. And they will use, actually, if they do it, they will use certain the element of nationalism, Iranian nationalism, which is very, very important for Iranians. We do it in the name of Cyrus the Great, or Darius the Great. We are Muslim, but we have beards, but we think that Cyrus was a great person. Okay? So a kind of a mishmash, I would say, that it could, could exist. I wonder, because uh, do you think, nowadays there is uh, economical pleasure in comparison to five years ago? because of the sanction. And so economically, people are very under pressure. And, and on the other hand, there is a lot of brain drains or intellectual when they uh, express themselves, either they are in prison or either they are outside, including yourself. Yes. So like Abdul Fattah, Sultani, Nagas, Sultude, Farhad, Nesami, everybody who expressed about human rights and this kind of Things. They are <coughs> so I wonder if something could be happen. Do you think a space uh, is vulnerable, or let's say, is it enough to be happen from <coughs> inside Iran or outside Iran? Because right now, so to go to to, to involve to a better Iran, I don't see space or. Um, or, or dialogue from inside Iran? You know, the only thing which can happen from outside Iran is a military intervention. Uh, what can happen? Well, Iranians from outside Iran cannot do anything. Because uh, you have to change things, you know, on, on the Iranian soil. So I don't think that there might be a leadership outside Iran. There might be a kind of a, like, like Khomeini did it actually himself. For, uh, from Najaf and uh, later on from Paris. Yes, but you need to have elements. And, and he had his elements. He had somebody like Talabani in, in, who got out of prison. He had somebody like Montezeri. He had somebody like Mutahari. He, uh, all the elements, the, the key elements of the Iranian revolution and Bazargan also, they were inside Iran. You know, they could organize demonstrations in 1978. And, and so that, that's a very, very important aspect that we need to take into consideration. Um, so I think that uh, certainly it's not going to work outside Iran, uh, and from, we cannot actually change things from outside. Uh, if there is change, uh, and the change is not coming from a coup d'etat by the revolutionary guard, because they see that Iran becomes very chaotic, and they are losing everything, and they might do that. Change will come with turmoil, as we're, going, we're seeing it, actually. It is happening. And turmoil, the reasons of the term, turmoil in Iran are economic. They are not political. I mean, people are suffering from uh, grievances, economic grievances. People are suffering because they're getting uh, uh, poorer. Uh, People are suffering. Uh, of course, there are also young people that are suffering for uh, because they are disenchanted because they don't believe in these Islamic values and they uh, 
and is but if if they can instead of doing a revolution i think they prefer to have a canadian visa and get out of iran <laughs> uh, uh, i don't see too many revolutionaries in the among the young people you know they yeah, I mean, they, they, they have become very, very pragmatic and uh, very professional, so they prefer to make a new life outside Iran, in the US, in UK, in Canada, in Australia, and elsewhere. Um, and, and look at the numbers, and they're actually growing uh, already, as I said, I think, around 6 million, 7 million uh, Iranians outside Iran, many of them, like yourself, professionals. Uh, do you think that nowadays Iranian movements needs a leader, if so, what characteristics uh, he or maybe she who knows? She would do much better. Okay, yeah. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I should have, because uh, I think mobilizing people is not enough. Uh, because for many, could mobilize uh, people, and since then, uh, the Iranian people have been suffering from the consequences. So, what do you think? What characteristic uh, the leader should have? I think the—I uh, I mean, that—that's me, of course. But uh, mm, the, the, I think the most important characteristic is uh, ethics, moral, moral leadership, more than political. Iranians actually need a moral leadership because they need to believe in a moral leader. We need uh, a, 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 either a woman or a man. But we need a strong moral leader. You know, somebody, I wouldn't say somebody like Dalai Lama, that could not happen. Not somebody like Gandhi, that will not happen. Iran is not going to produce Gandhis. That's India. But Iran can produce its own nonviolent leaders. Iran can produce its own moral leaders. Uh, again, a moral leader who is not necessarily a religious leader, but somebody who can bring a new ethics to this country, a new ethos. Because Iran, Iran needs today a new ethos, you know? Uh, I think we are, we are living, the, the worst part of uh, our country is that we are living in a time of disenchantment and disbelief in all values, except money. So you cannot build the country only on money and belief in money, you know? Uh, it's, it's not done. I mean, look at even America. Uh, America actually goes back, uh, when it becomes anti-Trumpian, it always goes back to somebody like Martin Luther King, who's my hero, somebody like uh, Henry David Thoreau, Emerson, Walt Whitman, uh, Jefferson, Lincoln, you know. Why? Because uh, you cannot build a nation on Donald Trump. You know, Donald Trump is an error of history. So <laughs> errors of history happen, and they come and go. Uh, we have a lot of errors of history in the Iranian Revolution, but they have to. Go, we have to understand these errors of history should be dissipated. They have. They will go. They have to go. It's a historical necessity. They have to go. They will go at some point. But what is going to replace them? Is, is it a new consciousness, historical consciousness? We are not going to repeat the same thing. We have to make sure that we're not going to. Repeat. So a leader or leaders who are moral leaders, they will underline that we are not going to repeat the same thing, including violence. We're not going to start killing people. And uh, the, the best thing which could happen to Iranians, as it has been happening to Tunisians, for example, again, having a national dialogue and making a new country, I would say. Um, I wanted to say that obviously everybody wants to leave Iran and like come um, go to the West. But for there to be actual change, do you think collectively they need to change that mentality and like fight and stay in Iran for there to be actual change instead of going to live a more like peaceful life for themselves? Like do you think people's mentality needs to change? I mean, who's gonna tell another person that is suffering, you have to stay, you're suffering, and you cannot leave. I mean, I will certainly not tell uh, a young Iranian who's suffering in, in Iran, anywhere in Iran, that you have to stay because I believe that you can make a revolution. You would say, the hell with the revolution. I, you know, I need a job, I don't have, I cannot pay my rent, 
I have problems with my boyfriend or girlfriend, I have problems with everyday life and I want to get out of this country because I want to go freely uh, here and there and do what I have to do. So that's the big problem. But uh, so it happened to the Russians, you know, it happened to the Russians, it happened to many other nations. Uh, some of the nations got over it and they were able to change things, and some nations, they didn't change things. They stayed the same after maybe 50 years, 70 years. They could, they could, could not change their authoritarian regimes. Uh, so I believe that, once again, um, uh, we cannot get into conspiracy theory. We should not take into consideration only the factors which are out of our will and out of our control, but we have to refer, go back to our own will as a nation and uh, try to analyze ourselves and say, let's see what is our capa capacity, our capability, what we can do and what we cannot do. Okay, what we cannot do, we do not talk about it. What we can do, we talk about it. And that's the most important. Uh, so I think it's, it's time to put end to nonsense. And, and because, you know, uh, I mean, life is short. So we have to put an end to nonsense and start really being acute and uh, try to see things as they are and try to see, uh, once again, what kind of spaces we have, like here tonight, that we can talk freely together and get to, uh, you know, resolutions that we need to get to. That's the most important, and actually, that's what I think. Okay, what can be done to convince the powers of the in Iran to abandon or restrain their military adventurism. I've never understood why they do it or why they prioritize it over improving Iran domestically. Stopping antagonizing the West can only improve the Iranian situation, in, in my opinion. Uh, removals of sanctions, etc. What can be offered or what form of pressure short of war can be done to get the Iranian leadership to change their course on of their actions of Salvaran. You know, sometimes in uh, human history, uh, you will have uh, politicians who do not have the wisdom to understand that they have no more place in a country or in power, and they have to leave. It's time to leave. Now, I believe uh, the British, for example, they had uh, this wisdom to leave India and to leave many of their colonies uh, in a proper way, and understand that they have to leave, for example, India to Gandhi and Nehru and the Indians. I'm not sure that the Iranian politicians or Iran, those who are in power, economically and politically, they understand that. I, they, they certainly don't understand it. Uh, because um, I'm, on a daily basis, I'm surprised, including by some of the Iranians who come to Toronto or to Montreal, I'm surprised by the fact that the only thing that is important for them, even those who have collaborated with the Islamic regime for 40 years, is at the end of the day to rob this regime and bring the money here and put it into you know buildings and uh, you know uh, and uh, uh, try to make a new life without trying at one one minute only to say. Did I do things right, or did I do anything wrong? This question is not there, once again. So uh, the, the problem with the Iranian, uh, Iranian regime is that they don't ask questions about, uh, the prop they don't ask questions of conscience about themselves. You know, the same questions that somebody like Eichmann didn't ask when he killed one million Jews. Uh, no problem of uh, six million Jews, sorry. sorry. Six million Jews. Uh, the problem that uh, they don't, he didn't ask him the problem of conscience. No problem of conscience. I, he said, I followed orders. So I, this, is a pro, this is actually a fact today in Iran. So again, I go back to my psychological analysis, which I think is very, very important when we're talking about a nation in change, what is going to come up uh, later on, and what has been done. If we don't look at what has been done, how can we? Uh, prepare a future uh, for a country like you want. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for the first little lecture. Uh, I was one of the professors that you said in 2009.
uh, what we agreed in the movement. And we tried to use a democracy movement as a kind of uh, referendum against the regime. And we tried to peacefully say no, which did not happen at all. Yes. And unfortunately, it changed from a kind of sedimentary of the educational level in 2009. And I want to say, sadly, now it's just in the kind of uh, lower sedimentaries of the society, which doesn't want, they don't I mean, care that much about the human right, intellectual factors, and they just need money for bread. Yes. Don't you think that is a kind of downgrading the movement that we had in 40 years? Kind of backwarding. And if you consider it as a kind of deadlock that we deal with, is there any help for future? Yeah, there are always hope with deadlocks, actually, with gridlocks, because uh, even a situation, uh, you know, when, uh, which seems completely blocked, again, you have a way out, you know, you have always a ways out in, in life. But uh, you're absolutely right. I think that there is a feeling of pessimism uh, today in Iran, especially among the youth, uh, 10 years after the re-movement, because uh, they think that they, uh, they fail. And because they fail, they don't think that they can, they don't have this power, they don't have this capacity of restarting it or starting a new or having a new beginning, and which is so important in politics. So this is one of the factors which actually creates, uh, I mean, the, the situation that we are in. Uh, the fact that we cannot move forward is because people don't have this will of moving forward. They would say, okay, we wait and see. I think there is a situation of wait and see. Now, wait and see has many dimensions for Iranians today inside and outside Iran. One, some, I mean, you got it in the question that they were asking me. One is very providential, you know? Okay, I wait and for a leader to come and save me. But, I mean, who does that? And what does it, I mean, we're talking, that's, that was the problem with the Iranian revolution because they had a providential side. Okay, we, I wait for Ayatollah Khomeini to come and change things for me. But I, I, are you doing a revolution to, for uh, Ayatollah Khomeini to come and change things for you? Or uh, you're doing a revolution because you have ideas about your society and you want to change things? So that is one side of it. The second side is that because of the absence of dialogue I talked about, there is no empowerment of the civil society. Even if civil society is very disparate, actually. You have uh, one feminist here who goes to prison, you have one intellectual here, you have one working class here, you have, uh, but they are not interconnected. So because of the lack of interconnection, again, there is no movement, there is no move forward. And uh, we, we are actually in a very stag in a, in a, in a stagnation, actually, in a very stagnant uh, situation. You know, nothing is going forward, and that's a big problem again. I'm not sure if this uh, mine is a question or a comment or a negative criticism, but so you keep mentioning that there's no peace in Iran, so what do you think is the solution to the situation that you are waiting for seeing what will happen? I think that what you have in your mind is like this, this big thing, whether or not it's a revolution or another alternative, and you are mentioning that we need a leader to organize and mobilize people. But I was thinking that if you, like I was wondering that when you compare, for example, the situation of Iran with the Soviet Union, there was not this kind of leadership or this big change in one night in the Soviet Union. It was a very smooth change and like very small yes. movements here and there. Like, um, and you said in response to our friend that because that these, these very small movements that are not related to each other, they're not communicating with each other, is a problem. But is it a problem? Is it like, doesn't go to anywhere? You know? Um, I mean, as I said, this, I think it's not, it shouldn't be any big change at least in Iran. Um, you're right. I mean, I'm not talking about big change, but I'm talking about change. I mean, uh, you might have a chain of uh, small changes, you know? Uh, and maybe some of these small changes, they create big change uh, later on. Uh, but change will certainly be there. Because, you know, when you have a country in stagnation, in chaos, 
with economic problems, people suffering. When and wherever in history you had a nation which didn't change, it always changed, always. In Europe, in different, uh, in medieval times, in modern times, you had in Latin America, Latin America changed, Chile changed, Argentina changed, Brazil changed. Why? Because uh, in uh, today's world, uh, you cannot have a country which, even in, in Africa, you don't have, you cannot have today countries which go on and on and on with chaos. I mean, they, 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 there has to be a change at some point. Now, this change is not necessarily an apocalyptic change, you know? I didn't talk about apocalyptic change. I, I don't believe in apocalyptic change, and I don't think Iran is going to have an apocalyptic change. But uh, it might be a change which actually takes several years, and it can be violent, it can be not violent. But I believe with the defeat, uh, as the gentleman was saying, with the defeat of nonviolent movements in Iran, especially the movement of 2009, and, 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 and the fact that uh, Iranian young people are really uh, becoming frustrated and tired, of things not changing, uh, there might be uh, there might be some violent changes. I mean, uh, revolutionary guards is only one aspect of this change that I talked, and this is from inside the regime. Uh, but there might be uh, you have, might have a series of turmoils for months and months and months in every city of Iran, in every small city, and even in rural areas, where people actually put uh, uh, buildings on fire. Uh, they might attack banks, uh, they might even kill uh, each other. Uh, but this would certainly happen, I think, because uh, there is no way, I mean, uh, you have a lack of management. Mm -hmm. Let's talk, let's say it uh, clearly. We have a lack of management, political management, economic management, cultural management, human management. Islamic regime has a lack of human management. You know, here we're sitting and we're having a human management. You're asking me a question, I'm answering you very politely, we're having a dialogue. Okay, we might disagree, but we have a form of management here. But in Iran, there is no management. I don't see any management anywhere. Not even inside the Iranian regime itself, I don't see this management. And that's, that's the most important factor, I think. Yes, this marks my 41st year of having immigrated directly from Iran to Canada. So obviously this experience, without having gone back. We came before. Yes, <laughs> yes. This influences my thinking and my optics are very limited to an outsider looking back at Iran. Yeah. And I feel you are the ideal scholar to answer this question on nonviolence steps towards solutions. I'm wondering now, it really makes sense when you have limitations on dual purpose technology, but in the last few days, very basic of air travel, civil aviation has yes. also fallen victim to sanctions. We had an aircraft crash, a 707 manufactured in the 70s. Mm -hmm. A few days later, they launch a rocket to, of course not successfully, to, to deliver a satellite. Now, going back to the viewpoint of the general public in Iran, do you not think those sanctions are actually a bit antagonizing? In both cases, if you do not want a confrontation, you would have to trade advantages. I'm not sure what remains in my obsolete memory of Iran, but on this side, I know the absolute advantage is with Airbus and Boeing to deliver reliable aircraft to Iran. Do you think that's realistic or is it Pollyannish? I want to triangulate between the emotive, intellectual, and observer. Somewhere in there. Yeah, but delivering uh, Airbuses and Boeings actually is a small uh, problem and a small issue, a big issue we're talking about. Um, so, uh, as I, I mean the crashes you were, uh, you were talking about relating to the news we had this week, again goes back to the crisis of management in Iran. I mean, nothing's working properly. It's not only the poli Iranian politics which is not working properly, Iranian economy, Iranian technology, nothing is working. And you have this discourse of victory, 
that we're going to do this and we're going to do that, but actually this, these kind of discourses come at the end of the reigns most of the time. Uh, and it's, it, it creates more chaos. It's, and uh, it, it, it also creates the suffering that I was talking about. You know, this suffering has been a, a very important element in the making of revolutions in 18th, 19th century Europe, but also in 20th century everywhere around the globe. Uh, so certainly, out of this suffering of Iranian people, there will be changes because you cannot contain suffering. You might not give empathy to it, you know? And the Iranian regime has no capacity of being empathetic, and I know that. But you cannot contain it. And this is gonna, we're gonna go from one suffering to another suffering. Actually, the crash of the airplane was one form of suffering, but you know, you have all these uh, labor movements, you have uh, strikes, bus crash. you have, what? Last week, bus crash. Yeah, the bus crash. Bus crash. Uh, you, have, you will have children killed, you will have, uh, you will have air pollution, uh, terrible air pollution, not small air pollution. So uh, I think that uh, there would be a moment of, uh, when we go from, uh, the, a moment of change that, I mean, people come out and say, enough is enough, we cannot breathe, or we cannot continue like that, you know? So it's like, uh, again, I, I, I take my paradigm of French Revolution when people came and said, we are hungry, you know? And Maria Antoinette said, okay, if you don't have bread, eat pastries. Uh, but I mean, the Iranian regime might say that, or if they're intelligent, might not say it, but they cannot provide uh, any solutions or any remedies to this suffering. If they could have done it, they would have done it in the past 40 years. And that's the most, most important thing which will happen. I hope that the Iranian people are not going to suffer too much and that we're going to turn the page of our history with not too much violence and not too much suffering. Thank you.